Good morning, everyone. We're really pleased you could be with us this morning on a challenging weather scenario, uh, but we're happy to have you. Uh, my name is Linda Bishai. I'm the director of the North Africa programs at the United States Institute of Peace. We are honored this morning to welcome Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi, president of the Nahda party and his delegation here with us today. I'd like to recognize the members of the delegation Unisi, Member of Parliament, uh, Mr. Osama El Sagayr, Member of Parliament, and Intisar Kariji, Program Director of the Jasmine Foundation, and also Sheikh Anushi's daughter. We are also very grateful to our co sponsors today, the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, for their partnership with us in ensuring to, that today's event is going to be a success. USIP, like many of us in the international community, has watched with admiration as Tunisia has forged ahead in its democratic transition in the face of growing terrorist threats, social and economic constraints, and the growing refugee crisis. We are especially pre pleased with the recent selection of the Tunisian Quartet to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for their instrumental role in providing Tunisia with a roadmap for democratization. With a commitment to act cooperatively in pushing forward with critical reforms, Tunisians today are at the crossroads of the old structures of the former regime and the new democratic institutions currently being strengthened and solidified. As the country continues to move forward, we remain excited by opportunities to learn from and be inspired by Tunisia, both from the strength of its leaders and from the passion of its citizens. Our guest today, Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi led the effort of forming a unity government in Tunisia after the Ben Ali regime. He has been an advocate for the compatibility of Islam and democratic governance, pluralism, and modernity. Since the revolution, Sheikh Ghanoushi has played a key role in the 2011 electoral success of the Nahda party and in the formation of the ruling Troika coalition and the success of the national dialogue which led to the adoption of the most democratic and progressive constitution in the Arab world. Sheikh Anoushi recently received the National Crisis Group's Peacemakers Award, along with Tunisia's president, Beji Kaidasi, whom USIP also had the honor of hosting this past May. The Founders Award is given to pioneers in peacebuilding, with Sheikh Anoushi being chosen for his unwavering dedication to pluralism, inclusion, and compromise during Tunisia's democratic transition. Following Sheikh Anoushi's remarks, we will be delighted to have Ambassador Bill Taylor, the Executive Vice President of USIP, and Robin Wright, Distinguished Joint Scholar at USIP and the Woodrow Wilson Center, join us on stage for a frank discussion uh, on challenges facing, facing Tunisia and the region. Previously, Ambassador Taylor was the Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions in the U.S. Department of State. He has been an advocate and champion for Tunisia from the very beginning of the post-revolution period and oversaw assistance and support to Tunisia from 2011 to 2013. Journalist and author Robin Wright is a joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Wright has reported for more than 140 countries on six continents for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and CBS News. Her book, Rock the Kasbah, Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World, won the 2012 Overseas Press Club Award for the best book on international affairs. I would like to announce at this point that Sheikh Anoushi has kindly agreed to address us in his speech in English. Um, we will leave the option of translation available, um, but uh, we are very grateful for, for that agreement. Without any further delay, I would like to invite Sheikh Anoushi up to the podium. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Thank you, Ambassador Tyler. Thank you for, for all distinguished audience. Thank you for 
Mrs. Robert Wright and the U.S. Institute of Peace for this opportunity. I am happy to be with you to give you an, an update on Tunisian trans, uh, transition to democracy. Exactly one year ago, Tunisians celebrated their second free and fair elections, although Nahda came second. We celebrated the elections as a victory for all Tunisians. As we see it, a free and fair elections is a victory, victory for all Tunisians. We congratulated the winners, the winner at the time, Nida Tunis, on their victory. Today, Nahda proudly serves in the coalition government that represents nearly 80% of parliament. This model of democracy, coalition and uh, consensus is being celebrated by all friends of Tunisia and all believers in democracy. But the road hasn't been easy. Just over two years ago, in 2013, Tunisia's democratic transition nearly collapsed. Many voices were raised seeking to shut down the parliament and stop the writing of the constitution. Tunisia, at the time, faced risks but the single most important factor for me was the hopes and dreams of generations in Tunisia and indeed around the region that our countries can achieve democracy. That being a Muslim and Arab and Democrat, we prove that it's possible. What mattered most for us was to protect national unity and save the democratic transition process. At that critical moment, we made a very difficult decision, rarely made by political parties. We gave up power that we won through free and fair elections and accepted to join the national dialogue. We also decided to choose reconciliation and not revenge against people who were in the old regime. We voted against the exclusion, the exclusion law, which would have excluded everyone who worked with dictatorship. We did this because we saw that happened in Iraq and in Syria, which led to the collapse of the state. We also believe that we need national reconciliation to open a new page in our history. So that we can focus on the present and the future, not just on the past. Our decision together with the other parties in the dialogue put the train of democracy on track. The writing of the Constitution was continued. We wanted a constitution for, for all Tunisians, not just the majority. That is why we consensus and dialogue as a means of solving differences.
as a result, as a result, the constitution was voted by 94 percent of parliament. We now have a constitution that guarantees democracy, human rights, equality between men and women, freedom of consensus, conscience and belief, and freedom of press. As a result, Tunisia had its second free and fair elections, and we are now building the institutions of the Democratic Republic. Throughout that, dif that difficult period, we have always tried very hard to avoid polarization, whether between Islamists and secularists, or between revolutionary forces and all the regime. This, I believe, was also very important for the success of the Tunisian model. Cooperation between moderate Islamists and moderate secularists is necessary for the success of democracy in our regime. That is why when we won the 2011 elections, we, choose, we chose and that is why after 2014 elections, we decided to join the coalition government with Media Two. We believe that transitional democracy, gov governing with 51%, is not enough. We need a wide majority to create a stable and strong government able to make the necessary reforms. The Nobel Prize recently awarded to the National Dialogue, quoted is testimony of our achievements. But Tunisia has not yet reached safety. Despite our huge progress, we have many challenges ahead. The first is the economy. Economic growth is key to building a uh, stable democracy. The revolution was a call for freedom, development, and jobs. Young people are now, wait, are now waiting to see if democracy can deliver any fruits. Our government is working hard to reform and modernize the economy and create opportunities for all Tunisians. We are introducing a new investment code, reforms and public-private partnership law. The second challenge is security. Our enemies know that if they attack the economy, they can undermine democratic transition and extinguish the last flame of Arab Spring. Nahda is working in government to protect the security of our citizens and vis visitors through a new counter-terrorism law and security reforms. Nada believes that ensuring safety and protecting human rights has, has to be compatible. Repressing freedom to protect security only undermines both. We were the victims of oppression before we are committed not to allow the old practices 
of oppression to return. We are committed to protect, protecting the human rights of our citizens and freedom of expression and the press. Despite the challenges, we are very optimistic. Tunisia has already shown biggest difficulties peaceful, peacefully, but we need your urgent support. We need a dramatic increase in international support from our friends. We need a mini Marshall Plan for Tunisia. Reform takes time, but we need to work together to show that democracy does deliver. Tunisia provides an alternative to the other narratives in the The first call for extremism, terrorism, and claim that Islam and democracy are not compatible. It calls for the clash of civilizations. The second claim that stability can only be achieved through dictator and oppression. Tunisia provide an alternative that Islam and democracy, Islam and the human rights, Islam and the equality between men and women is possible. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of uh, this large crowd um, on, on a rainy day uh, for your comments, for your broad explanation of the challenges as well as, as the successes uh, that you have contributed to and that all Tunisians um, get credit for. Um, we're very pleased um, to have Robin Wright, as Linda has uh, introduced her. Um, and if you agree, uh, Robin may have a comment or two. She is rarely without comment. And so, <laughs> so uh, Robin. Robin doesn't need my permission. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here and to share the stage uh, with Sheikh Anushi and my colleague, Bill, Bill Taylor. Uh, we go back now uh, to the late 1980s when uh, he left Tunisia and made his first visit to the United States. And he came to my house, um, and we sat for several hours in Georgetown discussing Islam and democracy. And much, of, almost everything he said back then um, is true today. And I have to say, he's kept his word in terms of sharing power um, with other political forces and uh, accepting the transition of power. Uh, so uh, I, I commend you on that. I think the, the key phrase he used was uh, that the, this is a road not easy. And I think that I wanted to outline some of the challenges this um, model country faces. Tunisia is, in many ways, uh, the hope of the Arab Spring, but also, in some ways, the real casualty of the Arab Spring. Uh, when you look at the presidential election uh, last December, I was an international monitor at the election. And it was pristine. Uh, the process was so well carried out, as all of four of the major monitoring groups concluded. And yet there were some real problems in that uh, the lowest turnout in the country was among the young. And the lowest turnout in a single city in Tunisia was in city Bouzid, where the Arab Spring began. Uh, when a young fruit vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire to protest corruption. Uh, and it's a microcosm, the election, of the challenges Tunisia now faces. Uh, today, 
when you look at the issues that spawned the uprising across the region, Tunisia now faces 15% unemployment nationwide, but 30% among its university graduates and 30% among uh, the young who live in the areas like um, Sidi Bouzi, the, the interior uh, areas outside the, the coast. There's also, a, 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 when you look at what the security situation is today, after the attack at the Bardo Museum in March that killed 22, and in the, at the beach resort in Seuss uh, that killed 38, um, this is devastating for a country that relies uh, on tourism and jobs in a country of 10 million. That's a huge, that's 14% of the labor force. Uh, Tunisia did more foreign fighters for the Islamic State and Sunni extremist movements in Syria, more than any other country, 3,000. With a security challenge. Since the Bardo attack in March, they have arrested more than 1,000 people and un uh, that were operating inside the country. So the security and the economic situation, you know, play off each other. They create a kind of cycle that's hard to break. Then there are some of the old problems that haven't been cleaned up. Uh, first and foremost, the issue of corruption. Uh, this is one that, that uh, Tunisia ranked 59th in 2010 on the eve of the uprising when it came to transparency and accountability. Today, it ranks 79th. Uh, the State Auditing Board found that last year alone, they could find $230 million in bribes to state officials, uh, which shows you the, it's the petty graph that is, continues to be rampant in Tunisia. Uh, anyway, I wanted to outline just some of the, the challenges I think uh, Tunisia faces. And then there's the fact that on, on all of your borders, you face tremendous insecurity, the weapons flows that come from Libya, uh, the uncertainty of whether Libya can even hold together, the autocratic rule that is returned to Egypt and led to a kind of discontent in North Africa. Um, the, Algeria, which is on the eve of a leadership transition, uh, and Morocco, which is clamped down on those who are, whether they are Islamists or uh, outspoken in criticizing the government. Uh, Tunisia is not in a region that is conducive in any way uh, to the kinds of reforms it's trying to undertake. And it faces election a year from this month, a municipal election, which will be key in helping people throughout the country feel empowered as if they reap the benefit, as if they have some control over their life. And I think it'll be very interesting to be able to compare what happens a year from now in those elections to what happened in December with the presidential election. Robin, thank you for uh, uh, going through some of the challenges. Sheikh Anucci mentioned uh, some of the ones you've, you've now focused on those as well. And Sheikh Anucci, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions here. Um, chances are Robin will want to ask a question or two. Um, uh, but then we would very much appreciate your comments, questions um, uh, for Sheikh Anucci as well. Um, and then we will wrap up by 11.30 just because we have another, uh, uh, the Sheikh has another meeting that he has to get to. So, but to, to start off, Sheikh Anucci, with Robin's reiteration of the challenges that you described as well. You described the economic challenge um, and the attempt by, by terrorists to disrupt the economy. And Robin pointed out the importance of, of tourism to Tunisia. Um, a great source. I mean, anyone, most people in this room, many people in this room probably have been to, to Tunisia and been to Tunis and have seen the potential um, of that 
uh, of, the, of the attraction um, and of the economic benefits of tourism there. So to strike at that, for terrorists to strike at that um, is a challenge that, that, you, that you mentioned. Um, and you talked about the counterterrorism law and the balance between safety on the one hand and people's rights and what you're fighting for in terms of democracy on, on the other hand. It's a challenge that all countries face, that we face as well. Um, Robin mentioned corruption. Um, again, a challenge that we all face. We uh, every day we can read the newspapers in, uh, in our country, and every day in every country there is that as well. Um, so if you were to focus, pick one of those challenges that this coalition government that you've described, what would, what would be your first, what, what's your guidance to the government? What is, your, what is the top, top challenge that you would raise? I think uh, there is a real uh, relations between the economy and the security. We couldn't uh, improve our economy without guarantee our security and uh, guarantee, guarantee the security vis-a-vis -vis terrorism is not uh, easy. If, as uh, Robin said, that our region is uh, full of uh, chaos. Yeah. And also, we have to respect human rights, uh, respect the law to contradict and to fight against terrorism. So we have to keep our democracy to save, respect our democracy in the same time to fight against terrorism. But uh, uh, the, the economy is very important because uh, most of the young people who deal with uh, or has linked with terrorism group, terrorist group, uh, they are coming from the poorest region of Tunisia, as you said. So you couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, fight against terrorism without fighting against the high level of unemployment in the country. So to have to face the economic problem and to improve our, our uh, infrastructure structure. So uh, the two problems are linked to each other. Right. And we have to face both the economy and the security. So the economy and security, um, uh, one thing and then Robert, right to you. Um, in, in respecting democracy in the same time. And in respecting democracy. Now yeah. on the, the third piece, on the democracy and indeed the governance. Yes. You've mentioned, uh, and Robin alluded to as well, um, that you're now in the second coalition government yes. since independence. Yes. So uh, Enata has joined uh, two coalitions yes. with secular parties, um, and you've demonstrated that, uh, that Enata, um, unlike other similar political parties in the region. And we're going to come, I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about the region. What is it about Tunisia um, that allows that to happen, that allows the, the Anatha party to join with, uh, with, co with secular parties? Um, and a broad coalition that now, as you say, the second coalition that you've been in, 80%. So it's a broad coalition. What is it about Tunisia that is the Tunisian model? I think you used it. Robin mentioned model as well. That, that might refute those who say that Tunisia is an anomaly. We've heard from several people, oh, Tunisia is the exception, it's not the rule. Um, is Tunisia a model that can be emulated? Is there anything, of, is, there, is there the ability to adopt the Tunisian model across the region? If, uh, each country, Arab country has its specificities. 
<laughs> we in Tunisia opt on uh, coalition government, on cooperation between Islamists, not all Islamists, moderate Islamists, and secularists, and also moderate secularists, because there are some ex uh, extremists, and their extremism based on modernity. Like, uh, for example, the far right, the, the far left, uh, against the far right. So we face in Tunisia both all sorts of extremism based on Islam, like the Ansar Sharia, and or the far left based on so-called modernity. But uh, we opt for uh, uh, inc inc inclusive, inclusive. inclusive, inclusive system where we can inc include and can all moderate can participate because uh, uh, transitional democracy, democracy within the transitional democracy, uh, government cannot be uh, based on simple majority, 51 percent. It has to be based on vast majority. We call it in Islam ijma, mm -hmm. sort of ijma, many, many, so vast majority. What we have done during the first coalition and the second coalition, the first coalition, uh, we led it. The second coalition, it led it led by uh, Nida Tunis, but we accept to participate um, by some uh, ministers to uh, support this uh, experience. And uh, that this model of uh, in Tunisia can affect positively other Arab countries. Robin, you wanted to... I, want, I yeah. want to ask a question. One of the things I heard in Tunisia in December was uh, the very sad story of a young t of a Tunisian who'd gone to Syria. And he, he, the story went that uh, he had called his uncle at one point, very concerned about that he wasn't as happy as he thought he'd be joining ISIS. And, uh, and that he was trying to get out, but he, they confiscated his passport. And that he kept in touch with the uncle. And then his uncle didn't hear from him, so he called. And uh, someone else answered the, the cell phone. He was a suicide bomber last week. He's, he has died. And you, the story implied that he had been forced into doing something that he didn't want to participate in. We're now a year, more than a year into this ISIS phenomena. Can you give us a sense of what you're hearing on the ground about Tunisians who are going and joining extremist group, be it Nusra, um, ISIS, or any of the others? How deep does it go? How has it changed? What's the government doing to try to stem the tide? Give us an insider's feel of, on this issue. Yes, uh... This question is very important, and uh, many people asked why Tuni Tunisia, which uh, under the de democratic regime, uh, cannot cannot control their uh, young people. Thousands of them join um, Iraq or Syria or Libya, join them as part of terrorism. You have to take in account that uh, this, uh, this phenomena is, new, is not new one. It's inherited by Ben Ali regime. So it's these people, these young people, uh, are the remains of Ben Ali regime, reaction of dictatorship regime. Even the total terrorism in the region are the fruit of terrorism, of, uh, of dicta dictators, whether in Iraq by Saddam Hussein, 
Now the remains of Ba'ath join in Iraq, join uh, ISIS, and in Syria also. And in, in Libya, the remains of Gaddafi join uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS. So uh, our region is victim of dictatorship regime. And uh, what you can expect to, to come out from such regimes. You, you can expect that democracy can emerge from this uh, uh, kind of, uh, of regime. The regime of Saddam, the regime of Qaddafi, of Bin Ali, of uh, half of Assad. The reaction of this tiny, the, this tyranny, the reaction is from the same from the same essence, from the same uh, identity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we gave another, uh, another, uh, we, we constitute another response. We refuse to respond the violence of regime Ben Ali and by violence, but we call for democracy as a, reaction, a real reaction because uh, uh, respond dictators by vi respond violence by violence it's circle without uh, exit so we have to avoid to react against but in Tunisia and in Libya and the Iraq Syria uh, everywhere uh, there are some People react against terrorism, against ter against dictator by violence. We refuse this regime and we refuse these uh, reactions. This is a, Robert. Hang on. This this is a very important point. Being here at the Institute of Peace, uh, yes. we uh, we look um, for those kinds of reactions. Um, we look to see how a nonviolent approach um, to mitigating and resolving conflict, um, and sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's real hard. And as you've said, there is a balance between counterterrorism, act, counterterrorist actions, actions on security to crack down, um, and, and on civil rights. But guidance for us uh, here at the Institute of Peace on how you, how this, Nonviolent approach works. What guidance can you give us or others in the region? And I know Robin has a follow-up question too. But but what guidance on on non approaches, Shaking the Church? Yes, we have to uh, to be committed with uh, the peaceful means in our uh, actions, whether uh, even if, uh, if the re regime is dictator, we have not react by violence because we enter in a circle without end. So uh, Tunisian people react against Bin Ali by peaceful revolution. And uh, this is the main character of uh, Tunisian revolution, that this revolution is, is uh, uh, peaceful revolution and uh, succeed to remove Bin Ali without using any violence. And after that, we, uh, we uh, opt on dialogue between Islamist and non-Islamist and uh, we establish uh, coalition government between both. So uh, we don't believe that we have to export this revolution because we don't believe uh, with exportation. But uh, if we succeed, if this uh, experience, this model succeed, uh, can be, um, can be, uh, uh, model for mm -hmm. others, good experience which can be 
uh, influence other or bene uh, others can have benefit from this experience, but without intervene any sort of intervention outside uh, our country, we refuse the, any sort of intervention. I, I want to go back to my question because I don't think you answered it. Um, uh, it's five years in December since the beginning of the uprising uh, when Bouazizi set himself on fire. And it's hard for me to believe that there are people who have joined ISIS or Nusra or Al-Qaeda um, in any of these countries are still reacting to Ben Ali uh, or the environment. It, it's in some ways a reflection of whether it's the secularists or the Islamists that have failed them. They, they, they don't believe that anyone's delivering. Uh, and I'm trying to get it, the deeper sense of you as the leader of an Islamist party, you know, um, how pervasive is this still? Is it growing? Is it, um, what's the kind of inside feel from having to deal with this from those who are believers themselves uh, and yet are joining not Anada, but they're joining, you know, the extremist movements? How, how is the problem deepening in Tunisia today than it was a year ago? Well, this uh, phenomena is very marginalized phenomena in Tunisia. It's a yes, the phenomena of extremism yeah. is very marginalized, very marginalized. It's, uh, as I said, the reaction of dictator. When the revolution started in Tunisia, the pre Tunisian prison contained more than 3,000 of these people. And they committed many crimes against the Ben Ali regime. And they join Afghanistan and they kill Sheikh Masoud, okay? Who killed, you remember, mm. who killed Sheikh Masoud was Tunisian. It's before, before revolution. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the environment was ready to. Uh, to push some Tun Tunisian young who are upset to, to join this uh, uh, il 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 illusion that they can, uh, uh, they can uh, solve the problem of Tunisia or the problem of Muslim nation by using violence against uh, regimes against Americans, against uh, any, any regime. So it's a lack of freedom in this, in this region, lack of development, lack of good education. Tunisia was, a, there is a vacuum during the, uh, during Ben Ali regime and Bourguiba regime, there was, a, sort of vacuum because the our governments during the independence they closed down to uh, the tuna mosque which was like azhar none, none of uh, terrorist has uh, educated has been educated in azhar do, do you hear that there is an azhari who join who join uh, terrorist group no because who study Islam, he discovered that there in, within Islam, within the uh, heritage of Islam, there are many opinions, many ishtihad. So you, you cannot um, establish a terrorist in Azhar. But uh, in engineering, it's, 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 uh, it's possible. In uh, uh, of technology, you can uh, you can establish a tourist. But the human, the human science, and uh, Islamic science among human science, it's not easy to educate a tourist. So there is lack of knowledge about Islam, lack of 
lack of democracy, lack of development. So this, is, this disease has to be fought not by the police only, but through good education, good uh, uh, economy. So, because this, this phenomena is very complicated, the phenomena of terrorism has to be fought with set, set of remedies. Sheikh Nuchi, you just mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the fact that many people don't understand Islam, as well as the other complicating factors. Robin Wright, um, ha in addition to the book that uh, Linda mentioned, uh, Rock the Kasbah, also wrote another book mm. about the Islamists are coming. Um, and Ro so if it's all right with you, I'm going to ask Robin a question on this, and you can comment on her response, which is, based on what you've seen now in Tunisia, an Islamist party, a Nahda, um, uh, leading the way in some real sense, how, do you, how would you answer, what's the concern in your book? Update your concern on the book on the Islamists are coming. Well, we actually, uh, it was very interesting. We, we did a, a complete rewrite of the book, uh, second edition. And there, there, the two bottom lines are first that political Islam, which soared into political life across the Arab world, um, is, has plummeted in terms of appeal and um, uh, position. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and extremist Islam, the other end of the Islamist spectrum, has, you know, is now the dominant trend. And this does not bode well for the likes of Ennahda um, uh, or those that are willing to work within the political system, the many branches of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it's clear that the old elites uh, are, are not going to, or, or are prepared to do almost anything to to hold on to power, to retake power again. Um, uh, and that, that this is one of the kind of tragedies, I think, of uh, the, the last five years, is that, that those hopeful parties that wanted to play ball legally, share power, um, have been have been either marginalized, excluded, or in the case of Egypt, you know, there was a military coup. So I think that's where we stand five years later. Um, and I don't see any reversal anytime soon unless there is some kind of military setback or in Syria and Iraq, or if there's a, um, eventually some kind of political uh, solution in one of those two places. But the momentum is all on the side of extremists right now. Any comments on that before we open it up to the uh, audience for other questions? We st I strongly believe that uh, violence cannot be any solution, but it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So the solution is to spread the modernity, the spread the dialogue, and the reconciliation. No no exit for uh, violence is uh, in it, it, it can complicate uh, the situation not uh, resolve so we have to spread the mentality of um, of uh, reconciliation dialogue and uh, spread the peace not the war we are in the We're in favor of that here. <laughs> we are in the right place. We are in the right place. You are in the right place. Welcome. Welcome to the Institute of Peace. So uh, let me now open the, the floor for questions uh, for Sheikh Ruti and for Robin. I can ask a question for Robin. You can too. Um, let's start here. Um, and there are mics that are coming toward you. Right here. Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Ghanoushi. I am myself a Tunisian citizen, and I think like many Tunisian fellows, 
uh, we have this question in the back of our head uh, that is, uh, what is happening for Ben Ali since you've mentioned many times that is the, he's the source of many problems happening today in Tunisia. Is it one of your priorities or concerns to uh, seek extradition for Ben Ali despite the fact that he's been sentenced to uh, life prison by a military court, but he's in Saudi Arabia right now. So what are you doing for having him back and face justice in Tunisia? My second question very quickly Party and moderate Islamist party, how do you define the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and have you been into discussion with them after the military coup? Thank you, Nate. Yeah, yeah. The Brotherhood in Egypt, so far, they abstain to react by the coup d'etat happened. And we encourage them to continue. We encourage their youth to continue reacting peacefully, because we believe that violence is a problem, not a solution. So if Juan Muslimin uh, continue reacting peacefully, so no problem. But uh, if uh, they, uh, they, they go to uh, violence, I think it's, uh, they, will be another, they will be another Juan Muslimin because the Juan Muslimin, the Brotherhood, as we know, uh, a peaceful uh, movement, not uh, violence movement, uh, movement so far. And Ben Ali? Ben Ali? She asked uh, about Ben yes. Ali. Ben Ali, we defend his right to uh, to to fair trial and to uh, to enjoy his identities like passport and uh, any identity. If he come to Tunisia, we want that he come back to Tunisia to be trialed. Yes, we asked. Tunisia government asked Arabia Saudi to to deliver to send Ben Ali to Tunisia, sent back to Tunisia. Good, thank you. Um, in the rear, yes, sir. Hello, assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan, Sheikh Rashid. Thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourself? And yes, my name is Muaz Zemni. I'm a Tunisian for 31 years now. Thank you, Dr. Uh, okay. Taylor. Thank you, uh, Ms. Robin. Now, your assessment is almost kind of oblique here. Uh, it's been commended for all the good work, saying Islamists are coming. It's a little bit, uh, you know, the title is kind of pessimistic. But uh, Tunisia has shown the way and has led the way. We need to fully support this country and its experience, not experiment. I emphasize, because this is not a workshop. This is a choice by the people of Tunisia to get on this march for democracy. The best investment is in democracy. Now, we're looking at the symptoms of terrorism, the symptoms of extremism. We need to address the roots. This is where the problem is. And like Sheikh said, we need a mini martial plan. A true plan, not half-heartedly support, a full support, full-blown support behind Tunisian experience and decision to get on this march for democracy. Half of the question is addressed to Sheikh Rashid. Sheikh Rashid, uh, you've shown the way and the way, and I consider you the new Gandhi of the era. Mahda has تنازلت كثيرا تنازلت اكثر من اللازم احيانا 
لكن في الجانب الاخر يعني كثير من الاستاصاليين كثير من on the other hand And on the other side, we see that Nada has really gave up a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things, sacrificed, made too many sacrifices. But this coalition, it's been seen as almost such as uh, status quo, jumut, immobilism. It's, it's paralysi in the country because nobody is really showing its color. You know, the, the, the Nida is not really showing its color. Nada is not really showing its is true governing. So it's, it's, it's a coalition, but it's not an actionable coalition. What are the red lines of the sacrifices of Anada? Thank you. Very good, thank you. We are part of this coalition, and uh, any government based on coalition it's uh, can uh, can uh, some quarrels some problems can uh, emerge from this uh, four parties in government but i think the the state the government is stable and uh, mr uh, seed uh, is independent, not belong to any of these uh, four parties. So he can uh, uh, he can um, uh, rule without uh, being uh, linked with this party or other parties. So it's uh, I believe, and I think that uh, the prime minister is honest and moderate person and he is in the right place so we back him we support him without any hesitation without any uh, any problem can i say right. one thing I, I, uh, I think the support of the united states from the Us supported the revolution, uh, but uh, its support uh, translated uh, very with mod modesty. We supported now by uh, all democracies. We uh, gain many prizes, Nobel Prize, uh, interna international uh, grace. Christ group from the uh, word has not yet translated into deeds. So uh, if uh, that experience considered as benefit not, not for, for Tunisians only, but it's uh, in favor of the all, all countries, because we um, we perform a new model, new interpretation of Islam, where Islam uh, is uh, compatible with democracy, human rights, uh, uh, international cooperation. So, supporting this. Uh, interpretation of Islam supporting this model is the only alternance of Daesh, of ISIS, of Qaeda. But uh, I, we see that uh, the investment on democracy is best if we cooperate it with the investment on fighting terrorism. But. Uh, uh, the, the short way for fighting terrorism it is to invest in democracy. This and investment is so far very modest. And you called for you called for a mini Marshall Plan, um, and uh, and that was referred to by the questioner as well. Robin, you had. I do, and I think you've put your 
finger on the real problem, and that's the political status quo. Uh, the fact is that a lot of the reforms have been stalled, particularly when it comes to economic issues, partly because of the labor unions. Uh, the government has actually had to raise uh, wages at a time that it should be trying to, it's trying, in, that World Bank says it needs to cut back on its budget. Uh, and so there's this tension. Uh, but there, there's also, I think, um, a sense that that the amnesty law they're considering to amnesty people who were charged with corruption under Ben Ali uh, perpetuates the status quo. If they pay back some money, then they're not going to be charged. They're not, you know, they'll be open to be part of the of the system again. And I think that it looks like you're, there's a slippage into the ancien regime getting more of a role. And of course, those are the people who would who might be able to get the big contracts and so forth. But there is this catch-22, and that's why I say Tunisia is a, a casualty, that you can't get private investment, and people are not willing to invest because of security issues. Um, and, you know, tourism is down 25 percent from what it was in 20, 2010. And that's, that's a devastating blow. So you have not only new sources of revenue, but you don't even have some of the old sources of revenue. So they're trapped economically in this, and, and declining, um, trapped in the status quo politically and, and declining when it comes to the economy. And that's why I think it's a casualty. Yeah, we all want a Marshall Plan. We want a Marshall Plan for all of these countries. The, I think one of the biggest U.S. mistakes was, in, as in the case with Libya, oh, we're willing to get rid of Gaddafi, but we did squat all when it came to trying to help build uh, a new Libyan government. And of course, that has an overspill impact on Tunisia and, and countries, you know, south to the Sahel and across North Africa. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a real tragedy. Uh, and, I, and I fear that Tunisia can't break out of that cycle and no one's going to help it. Call it David. So, uh Calm down. Um, yes, right back here, and then we'll, yeah, right here. Thank you. Marhababik, um, Washington, Sheikh Rashid. My name is Asma Ghribi, and I'm a Tunisian journalist. My question is, um, so another campaign on things like uh, social justice and breaking with, breaking with the corrupt and repressive practices of the past. Unfortunately, now senior Nahda members have been speaking in favor of this amnesty law that was just mentioned now. So how, how does Nahda explain this shift in its position, especially that before, two years ago, Nahda flirted with the, with the law of the uh, political exclusion? Thank you. It's true that we uh, exclude to legislate uh, the project of uh, ex ex exclusion, exclude the former uh, isolation law. We refuse this uh, project, and we consider that uh, very important because what happened in Iraq, in Egypt, where the, such uh, such project um, become a law and uh, it's uh, constitute a base the text of civil war. So uh, one of the characteristics of uh, Tunisian model, Tunisian exception, is that we avoid such uh, law and uh, we opt of uh, cooperating between uh, uh, the future, the present, and the future, uh, the the past, mm -hmm. and uh, because crime, uh, we cannot we cannot uh, condemn by collective the, the people. Uh, the crime is personal, is uh, uh, is individual. individual. So, but about. Uh, of uh, economic con reconciliation sent by the president. Permit me to ask uh, our member of parliament, Saida, to explain. So. Yeah, right here. 
Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, uh, thank you for, for coming and to show interest on, on what's going on in Tunisia. Um, actually, uh, economic uh, development is, is something very important for us at the moment. We've been suffering, uh, I mean, during decades uh, from a system which was a very exclusive one, uh, based on favoritism, on uh, an economy. I mean, the, the consequences of it. And the Tunisian state, who was kind of, for years, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the, the difference in, uh, in being able uh, to control the social uh, situation, is no longer able to do it because uh, it's uh, definitely a time here. And when it comes to. Uh, which is more actually a law uh, which is uh, a transitional justice uh, law. Our idea today, uh, this is one of the options we're working in, uh, is uh, in accordance also to the recommendation of interna international organization, is to how to actual existent uh, transitional justice law. Uh, our government uh, and who shows that uh, this is the right uh, way, actually, to fulfill transitional justice. And uh, we have a reality, which is that those who actually uh, hold the capital in Tunisia need to be included in the process of economic development. And th this is also why we adopted just one week ago the uh, public partner. Uh, we believe that we need to work in good intelligence with the private sector and the public sector. And uh, this is also uh, why we are in a moment where we are redefining I think, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, middle uh, countries like us uh, are, um, are facing. Uh, we can no longer uh, work uh, with uh, the, the previous system. And um, this is why also it's important for us to, to come here uh, to, to speak with uh, also our European partners because we are again uh, in a moment where we're thinking about new ways, uh, new inno innovative ways uh, of development and we want to uh, invest massively in, in sectors like for example the agriculture one, technologies and to make uh, Tunisia also being one of the leaders in the green economy. Uh, so this is, um, as, as you can see, I mean, a lot of the uh, uh, path we are trying to develop and to work in. So, thank you, thank you very much. Um, very good idea, Sheikh Nuji, to have uh, the face of, uh, of uh, the Tunisian parliament, uh, a member of the uh, Nasta yes, party, yes. A, a, a great representation. And, and she, she's member of, uh, of uh, finance committee finance in the committee. parliament. Thank you, Sayed, for, for doing that. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dave Ottaway from the Witter Wilson Center. Uh, I wanted to ask you, a year ago there was this political party separate from the movement. And I'm wondering where you have come out on those discussions. And it does strike me as a little strange to have a movement that also has a dawa function inside a coalition government. This discussion is continued <laughs> so far because to decide in this uh, in this ideological problem. Now we are a political party. In the same time, we are uh, social social. Uh, movement, we are social mov movement, we have uh, uh, activities in, uh, with the trade unions, for example, activities with uh, cultural uh, uh, field. But uh, now, we, our uh, vision is going to sort of division of separation between uh, the political activities and the social activities. Perhaps uh, in um, next ma March, 
this our conference can de can decide our congress will be held in uh, next march and can decide this uh, in this problem thank you very much sir assalamu alaikum uh, Dr. Ghanoushi, I would like to have, uh, my name Amin Mahmoud from Center of Egyptian-American Relations, and I would like to have your advice what the Egyptian can do uh, against a fascist uh, dictatorship uh, uh, regime in Egypt uh, who kill his own people with women provided by United States and the West, keep giving them that and create a lot of radical people join ISIS. Uh, the coup happened in uh, 2013, while uh, Tunis have a problem in that time. That's why a lot of Tunisians uh, join ISIS and many Egyptians join. And the future is grim. Many people will join ISIS and join all radical group because the West is sleeping or they don't understand why ISIS exists after attacking uh, Iraq. And uh, immigrants from Egypt will happen if that situation continue downhill in Egypt. And you talk about peaceful resistance. Peaceful resistance is something we support, but the young people, again, is that. is a struggle between the old and the young people from Muslim Brotherhood and liberal group who are in prison also, when you're looking at above 40,000 prisoners in Egypt. Thank you. I don't see any solution in Egypt different from the solution in Tunisia and everywhere is to, uh, to commit, to have a strong commitment with the peace, with the democracy and uh, refuse any sort of react against the violence, the official violence by popular violence, because it can uh, lead to more victims and more catastrophe. So I, uh, uh, my advice is to seek a reconciliation between the army and uh, Juan Muslimin and liberal and Copt, because these bodies are uh, well implemented in Egypt. So why we 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 uh, why we waste our time and our blood in fighting each other? So. Uh, this is the solution is to seek a real dialogue, real conciliation. If the regime now, uh, now uh, refuse, we'll be convinced tomorrow that there, there isn't any, any, sort, any sort of exclusion. Is, it's impasse, not, uh, not solution. Yes, sir. Thank you. John Anderson, uh, independent uh, analyst. Uh, Sheikh Rashid, uh, you were, uh, for something I believe over 20 years, uh, uh, a political exile uh, during the period of uh, repression and violence under the Sin Labadin uh, bin Ali regime. Um, in effect, uh, in exile, uh, a form of uh, amnesty in France, in the UK. Um, following up on uh, the, the issue of uh, Egypt, region relations, uh, a rather more specific question. Um, uh, in the aftermath of uh, the military coup in Egypt uh, and the violent uh, repression, thousands killed, uh, uh, many hundreds uh, continue to be jailed. Uh, not just Ikhwan Muslimin, of course, but liberal and leftist uh, activists uh, as well. Um, did, during the period of the first, uh, I believe, government, did uh, uh, any overtures, uh, were any overtures made to provide uh, 
political uh, amnesty, uh, exile to uh, uh, the, those Egyptians facing repression. We know that many went to Qatar. Uh, others found uh, exile and asylum in uh, other countries. What was the position of the Tunisian government? What, what uh, uh, offers were made of political asylum uh, to uh, Egyptians? And if not by the coalition government, uh, then by Hezb al-Nahda or Harak al-Nahda. Uh, what uh, kind of positions were taken at that time? And thank you. Tunisia استضافت hosted more than one half million million and half Libyans during the revolution and until now Tunisia is open country. Uh, any any uh, talab, yani, any request. request from uh, Egyptian to uh, to seek asylum in Tunisia. If someone did that. I think uh, Tunisia is part of uh, UN countries, which uh, the uh, which uh, give the right of uh, arrested or oppressed in his country to seek in any democratic uh, country. So t Tunisia is open. So I think we have time for. One more question here, please. Yes. Thank you. Manar Huni, Middle East News Agency, Egypt. Uh, Sheikh Rashid, I want just to ask you about how do you see the future of Muslim Brotherhood as a group, especially that you said now that uh, you encourage them just to uh, stop violence and to resort to the peaceful uh, protests. So how do you see the difference between the elder uh, leaders and the young who are now calling for uh, violence or for just uh, violent protests. I think as Nahda uh, that Muslim Brotherhood is still an umbrella or for all Muslim uh, groups so far up till now as it had been before. Thank you. I, according of my knowledge, I didn't hear that uh, Juan Muslimin Brotherhood in Egypt, but still refuse react reacting by violence. That's what I hear. I didn't hear that they belong now to the terrorist group and become part of Al Qaeda, of ISIS, of uh, even Britain, which uh, which uh, invest. Uh, investigate in this matter whether Akhwan Muslimin are a terrorist group or not. Doesn't uh, uh, the result is that Akhwan Muslimin are not a uh, terrorist group. And I think another part of the question was the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and other Islamist uh, parties. In, in the our, our movement, Nahda movement, is a Tunisian movement working within Tunisian law, it's independent. But we have a relation with all uh, uh, Muslims in the world who are, uh, uh, do not use violence. Sheikh Anushi, that, that is a good ending um, for this. We are, um, uh, your presence here, um, your message, um, of, uh, of the existence and the possibility of Muslim, Arab, democratic, moderate politicians and the ability to form those characteristics into a governing body, into Tunisia, 
still with the challenges that both you and Robin have, have outlined, still in need of support from the United States and Europe and the international community, but nonetheless, you are showing that there is a Tunisian model that you've both, both referred to. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for being back here again. I want to thank Robin for her good questions and her presentation. Um, please join me in thanking Sheikh Anucci for his presentation.